What's up, brewers? Welcome to the show. Today is all about yeast. I'm going to show you guys how I overbuild my yeast starter so that I have enough to ferment six gallons of wort. And, and there's going to be a starter left over so that we can do this process over and over again. This is one of the best ways to save money on your brew day. You can just buy one $10 vial of yeast and you can make this last 5, 10, 15 brew days from now. And you get to get more hands-on. You get more in-depth with your beer. Not only are you saving money, but you're learning the environments that yeast thrive in, the things that they love, the things that they don't like, um, and how it interacts with the beer. So this is a great process. I really enjoy it a lot. You get to save money. You get to be more hands-on with your beer. I've been doing this. I've been doing this a couple of years. I heard about it first from the guys at Brewlosophy. The article is linked down below. But since then, people all over have been doing this. Homebrewers do this all the time because it is such a great way to save money. So with that being said, uh, let's get into this. Let's see what you need. Uh, you're going to need a flask, Erlenmeyer flask. You're going to need a stir bar, of course. You gotta have a scale. Scale's a great piece of gear you're gonna use through your whole brewing career. Get a little bowl, you need some yeast, you need some aluminum foil. That's gonna be our lid. And you gotta have something for the yeast to eat. We're gonna use some DME, dried malt extract. This is the Pilsen Extra Light. You wanna get as light as you can just so it doesn't impart any flavors that you don't want into your yeast and your beer. All right, you're gonna need some other stuff and we'll get into that and we'll roll right through it throughout the video. So a two liter flask is the smallest flask that you're gonna get away with using this overbuild process. It is just on the limit of being big enough so that you have enough yeast to ferment your six gallons of wort and enough left over for a starter. Water. Water matters. I use the same water I use for my brewing. I just have a little two-stage carbon filter. It does a great job, just knocks out any of the chlorine or any of the other funky stuff your water department is putting in your water. I highly recommend using whatever you use for your brewing water. I would definitely strongly prefer not to use tap water just because of the chlorine effect. I don't like how it tastes and how it interacts with the yeast. So you can go from there. Um, there's a handy little equation. You're going to need one gram of DME for every 10 milliliters of water. So I have two liters of water and that equals 200 grams of DME. I added a little extra water to this just because it evaporates when it boils. So there's another 100 milliliters in here. So I just up my DME by 10 grams. You got the math? I am sure that you do. Okay, so now we have our water. I'm gonna show you my process. I don't boil everything in the flask, although I do boil the water in the flask. I got a big pot over here. It's just a, um, it's just a six quart stock pot. Any pot will do. Bigger the better so you don't get boil overs. So I pour my water in there. I keep about 800 milliliters or so inside my flask so that I can heat it and sanitize everything through boiling and steam. It is also important. You want to add your stir bar to your flask before you boil it. We're also going to add our foil lid to the flask before everything gets crazy hot. Nice loose fit on here is what you are looking for. If you don't add the stir bar to something like this, it's called superheating and your flask can just like, the water can just blow out, explode. It'll, superheating allows the water to get above 212 degrees, but the stir bar just adds a nice little something in there to uh, help, help the water bubble and get some nice boilage in there. So I'm going, so I'm going to get them both on heat and now I'm going to measure out my dried malt extract. 
Here we have our scale, and here's the bowl. This is the bowl I always use. It is 120 grams. It's always 120 grams, so I wrote it on the bottom. Just in case the scale gets reset or something, I can just do a little math and figure out where my measurements are. We set that to zero grams, and we are going for 210 grams. We went over, but that's okay. So I'm just going to grab a regular old spoon. We're just going to scoop some out and put it back in the box. I'm kind of making a mess. All right, you got to remember, with DME, this stuff is crazy around moisture. You want everything wonderfully and beautifully dry. Okay, where are we at? 210, beautiful. Our water in our vessels are all getting nice and hot and bothered. Now I'm going to add in the DME. So it's okay if it starts off a little clumpy and stuff as it heats up and it'll just continue to mix into solution. Um, give yourself a good little uh, stirring stick and give it a rip. You don't want your heat on high um, to risk for boil overs or anything scorching. So medium, medium high till it gets up to a boil. It's coming up to a nice boil. No boil overs. If it does start to boil over like this, blow on it. And it'll take it right on down. Once I reach a boil, set your timer for 10 minutes. Also, if you're, um, you got a bunch of scraggly little guys, little DME is on the rim, you can just put this back in the bowl, back in the, the little sweet wort we're making here, rinse it off, and you are good. We're up to a nice boil. Now I turned it down just so they can simmer for 10 minutes. The flask is going to sanitize itself from the boiling and the steam coming out. And we're boiling the starter work for 10 minutes too, just to kill any of the little funkies or anything else that is in there. Just so our yeast have something nice, clean, and sugary to eat. Our 10 minute boil is up. Now I'm going to take them over to the sink, combine them, and show you how I cool them down. Alright, for this hot stuff, we are going to need a glove. It is very important that your Erlenmeyer flask is made out of borosilicate glass. That is what keeps it from shattering and exploding. All right, here we go. We got our uh, sweet starter wort all boiled and ready to go. We'll take our cap off. This is a nice pour. There we go. Beautiful. You can use a funnel if you want. You're just going to have to sanitize it. Um, I don't need a funnel personally. It's just one more thing I have to sanitize and I don't want to. So. Here's where my system is just a little bit different. So I take the pot we just used, take cold water and wash it off. I just make sure that it gets all cooled off, rinsed off. Now this is going to be our container to where we cool off our flask. We're just going to fill this up. We're going to start with cold water. Just let it take some of the heat out of the flask. Then we'll add some ice and let it sit for a bit. So at this point in the process, everything needs to be sterilized that is near the flask or going into the flask. Best practice, keep this foil cap on there all the time, 100% all the time. Don't let anything come into contact with it besides the yeast that we're going to add. 
but you can't add your yeast until everything is at room temperature. You want your yeast and your wort to be within one to two degrees of each other, too hot, and it's just gonna kill off your yeast. You want it right at room temperature. Not sure if I mentioned it before, but you want your starter wort right at 1040. Maybe a little up, maybe a little down, but 1040 gives your yeast the best nutrient, the best sugar to eat. Too high, and they're gonna get stressed out by eating it too low, not enough food and nutrients. So the powers that be, people smarter than I am, have figured out 1040 is the magic number. Usually it comes out to 1040 if you follow the little equation, if you do 100 grams per liter of water, it gets you right in that target area, right where you want to be. The water did its job. It took a lot of the heat out of the flask. Now I'm going to add the ice to the pot. So this is my method and it really works well for me. My ice maker makes this amount of ice and it just so happens to fit perfectly within this pot. So when you put your ice in, you want to run some cold water in there, fill your pot up as much as you can. My favorite part about this process with keeping everything in the pot is that it's all self-contained. So if my kids need to use the sink or something like that, they're not going to mess up my project and they have free reign to do what they need to do. So we've got a nice little pot. The flask sits in here with the ice. And we're gonna leave that for about 20 minutes or so and let it knock down to room temperature. Our flask has been in here about 15 minutes or so. I'm gonna give it a shake and see what our temperature is at. It is definitely cool to cold to the touch. And that tells me that it's done. Um, but I also have this fantastic digital thermometer. Works off a little laser. Just shoot it down in here. Saying we're at 65. 68 at the top, 76 up here, but that doesn't matter. So it knocked down the temp, and I don't have to stick anything in here to take its temp. I do not recommend that at all. You can get one of these if you want. Do not have to have it. Um, everything you see, anything I'm messing with, touching, whether it's gear or something, I'll leave a link down below in the description so you can find it or learn more about it, whatever you need to know. We got everything at room temperature. Now we're going to put our lovely yeast in. I am using the Propagate Labs. This is their 101. It's their Chico Variant 2 strain. So here we go. We're gonna shake it up, mix it up a little bit, get everything all incorporated into there. It is lovely and mixed up. Now, here comes the magic, right? We're gonna take this sweet starter wort, just DME and water, add some yeast to it. Oh, it smells fantastic. Add some yeast to it, and we're going to just let these beautiful yeasties multiply, propagate, and do their thing. They are gonna feast. Everything in, everything is in. All right, I'm gonna go take this down. I'm gonna go put it on the stir plate. Here's our stir plate. There's a little computer fan and a magnet on the inside that connects with a stir bar. Connecting the stir bar to the stir plate can be tricky sometimes. I use magnets to locate the stir bar. Set the flask on top till I feel it connect to the magnet. Put the flask into place, hit the power. Hopefully you get it on first try. It may take a couple. Look at those yeasties spin. The coning yeast doesn't have a huge head on it. This is just what it looks like at its peak, eating up all those beautiful sugars. Our yeast has been spinning for about 36 hours or so, and it is ready to get into our different containers. If you blinked, you might have missed it. This is the coning yeast. It's not really known for a high flock or big croisin on it. So when it was spinning, 
there are bubbles just right around the edge on it and it raised up a little bit and that's just what it looks like when it is eating the sugars. And then you can tell when it's done, it's still spinning of course, but there are no longer any bubbles, no foam, no head, no nothing around on the outside rim edge when it is spinning. But a good 24, 36 hours and healthy yeast, it's going to eat and complete its phase anyway. Just to say that the Conan yeast is more difficult to see when it peaks and when it is finished. If you have some other yeasts like a high flock, a high croissant yeast, like a top cropper, they act and look different. They'll have a big head on top of it and you can tell when it peaked and also when it is finished eating and everything comes down. That's a lot easier to tell, but still a good healthy yeast 24, 36 hours later it's going to eat and be complete after all of that. Now we're going to get it into our other vessels. I'm gonna show you how I do that. First, you have to get out your stir bar. You don't want your stir bar in a different container and you do not want to pitch it into your wart. So here we go, stir bar out, beautiful. Remember, everything's sanitary, sanitize. Keep it clean, folks, keep it clean. You're gonna make everything uh, all shaken up, all into solution. And here we go. I'm going to pour it into my jars. These are one quart, one liter jars, and they have nice milliliter markings all up and down the side. I'm going to use three jars. One is going to be for our starter that we're gonna save. The other two jars will be for the wart. Or you can just keep it in here. I'll talk about that in a second. First, I'm gonna pour off our yeast starter. I like to have 800 milliliters for this. Ta-da, there you go. There's our yeast starter, all saved up for next time. And I will label these in a second. Everything has been sanitized. These glass jars and the lids have been soaking in star sand. And this is going to get about 600 milliliters, just like that. I used to boil my uh, jars, but um, there's just not a need for that. Star sand does such an amazing job that we just let it take care of the business. All right, every last drop. All right, we have these beauties all poured off. A different way of doing it is you can pour off your starter and keep that in its jar, nice and labeled for later. And the rest, you know, the, what went into these two jars, you could keep in here. You could absolutely keep it in here, put your lid back on, and you can stick it in the fridge ready for brew day. I don't do that because it takes up too much room in my fridge. There's barely ever room enough for a flask like this. And this is a small two liter, but if you up it to a three liter or five liter, there's no way my fridge has that much room. So this is my workaround. This is what really works for me. This is gonna be saved and these are gonna be ready for brew day. I have a low key labeling system. I just use painter's tape and a Sharpie I just make sure that it has on the uh, yeast manufacturer's name and what strain it is and the um, harvest date that we did all of this goodness. And the starter will have starter written on it. And the other two that are going into the wart will just be labeled A and B. And it's just that easy. Everything's labeled. Now it's time for them to go into the fridge. I know many people are worried about the yeast still eating and off gassing and then the jars exploding or blowing their top. I've been doing this for two plus years and I've never had that happen. Um, please feel free to keep your lid loose as you put it into the fridge. Um, that's what a lot of people do just out of fear, nothing happens. Um, I just tighten mine all the way. I've never had anything explode or bust. Um, even when I was using the metal rings, I didn't have a problem with that. I have switched to plastic. I like the plastic lids better. 
the metal rings, they just seem to rust on the inside easier than I would like, and I just didn't want that contamination happening in there. So feel free, keep your lids loose for a day or two in the fridge, then tighten them down. I just crank them all the way down and into the fridge. So I'm gonna cut in here because I really wanna show you that there are two different methods for getting the yeast into the wort. You can do the three jar method like you just saw me do in the kitchen. Um, this is a different brew day and I just had two quick days before I was brewing. So my yeast was just sitting in the stir plate, you know, just until recently. I didn't even have time to put it in the fridge and let everything settle at all. It's just nice and fresh and in the flask. I did pour the starter. So here's my starter. This will go in the fridge and sit till next time, just like we did before. But everything else is in here. And uh, the Brewlosophy guys, they were saying that people couldn't really tell the difference between pitching the whole thing, yeast, starter wort, and all, versus making yeast cakes, letting the beer settle and chill and decanting it, like I'm gonna show you later. So, here goes, everything in. Our yeast have been in the fridge for about three days now, and they are looking wonderful. Check this out. They're fat and healthy. There's about 50 milliliters in each one, 100 total. These beauties are gonna chomp down on some wort. So let's get them in there. So here is what I do. I decant most of this off. So this is the uh, starter beer, and um, it's also called supernatant is its technical term, just kind of the, the liquid on top. All right, so everything needs to stay nice and sanitary. I am just, it's been sitting, the yeast cake is nice and still. I'm just going to pour off and just leave a little bit left in there so that I have enough to swirl and mix it up. Something like that is good. There's about 200 milliliters of liquid in there. And the same for this one. So now we'll just swirl. Let's get some yeast in our wart. All right, beautiful. I'm gonna shake this up for Whoa! I'm gonna shake this up for a minute or so, get everything mixed up in there and uh, get some oxygen into the wort, into the yeast, so that is ready to eat on this. I always make sure I take the labels off my jar and put them on the fermenter, just keep everything nice and labeled up. All right, hope you enjoyed the show. Um, all the equipment I use will be listed down below in the description. Please like and subscribe. Thanks for watching.